Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Turner, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney magic. Whether they be singers, actors, imagineers, animators, they've all made their mark on the Disney name. To find out more about the show and other episodes, head to our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. Be sure to look below at the show notes in the show more section for links to our Twitter and Facebook pages, including videos and websites mentioned in the following interview. Photos and audio clips that are featured in the show belong to their rightful owners and are used for educational purposes only. All guests' opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, actor Michael McShane, to the show. Welcome, Michael. Hey, how's it going, Tierra World? Ah, doing fantastic. It's Halloween season. I'm always excited for this because I get to dress up as any Disney character I want and not get judged for it. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. What are you going to go as this year? Uh, I don't know. I was either going to do Dory, Meg from Hercules. And who would you dress up if you could dress up as any Disney character? Oh, gosh. Well, I played Tuck and Roll in Bug's Life, so that would be fun to dress up as a bug. Um, <laughs> um Q, really kind of that's easy to put together. I don't know. Oh, you know who I would play and who I'd like to do is an old Disney, uh, Carl Barks drawing of a uh, gyro gear loose from uh, the, the Donald, Donald Duck characters. He's the crazy, wacky professor who has, a, you know, like the old, he's got a garage in the backyard. And uh, that animation style was, you know, uh, uh, mid 20th century or early 20th century drawing style. He, and Carl Barks sort of modernized him in movements and stuff. But if you look at the shape, you go, there's a lot of characters that were drawn, some characters that were drawn like that in early cartoons, mm -hmm. like Fleischer cartoons and things like that. Now, most of our listeners will recognize you as Q, the funny quartermaster and mechanic in the made-for-TV film Tower Terror. So did yes. you audition alongside other actors for the role, Q? What did they do? I think I, no, I think I went in on tape. I, went, I did a tape with the casting director, and then uh, I went in with, uh, I think it was DJ McHale, the director. And, uh, yeah, we, I just auditioned for him, and he liked it. Also, I think it helped. I'd just come off of Richie Rich or something, so um, I was, like, specializing in quirky, weird dudes. And he went, okay, you can do that, you know? What was the backstory behind Q that he gave you to kind of run and go with? Oh, he wanted the guy to have a lot of heart, and he was sort of, like, you know, saddled with this, uh, this hotel that's been disused because of the haunting, and... He sort of wanted to make peace with it. And he's he's seen by his family as a rich failure. So you know, he's, I mean, the, the the he's got money, but not enough. He's, and it's killing him to maintain the place, and yet he has a sense of pride about the place because he came through his family because his grandfather was the elevator operator in it, and um, so it was that sort of thing. He was he was sensitive to that and had a, a sense of pride in the place, and so. You know, it, the adventure was connected to him personally. He he wasn't interested, but he wanted to make right. And then when he found out that it was a curse, there was a potential maybe for it to get around it. You know, that was good. In, in the end, you know, at the hotel, he's all dressed up in a tux, and he's rich again, and he's happy and satisfied. So Still has the sandals on, though. <laughs> he still has the sandals on. Yeah that's, yeah, that's the sort of like, you know, hey, dude, touch. So from what I've read, you've got a chance to film on location at the Tower of Terror, ride attraction yes. in Walt Disney World. So uh, did you get to experience the ride when you were no. out shooting? No, because it was very, we don't have to shoot selected parts at the park because it was an ongoing ride. They're not going to stop the ride for us to shoot. The interior, like you see at the end of the show and at the beginning was, uh, the beginning was we shot in there in a late night. And then in the end, they recreated a portion of the set and in a studio in Silmar, and we shot in there. And then some of the outside stuff was a uh, an estate in Hollywood off of Hollywood Boulevard. And, whoa, gosh, like Coenga or something. It's up in the hills. Um, and they just remounted a fake gate with the top, you know, uh, that, that ornate top on that. And we, you know, when, when uh, Gutenberg walks up to the gate and opens it and walks through, and I, that was all uh, in, in L.A., in Hollywood. So there were those sets. And then we were in the basement of the hotel, the Raymond Hotel in Pasadena. 
when you first see me, it's two different locations. It's the Raymond Hotel, and um, it's the place up in Hollywood. And the Raymond Hotel is the exact, it's the model for the Tower of Terror. It's that pink, sandstony looking, you know, style of uh, mid, mid tw- early 20th century hotel. And the film has a fantastic cast. So do you have any funny stories of working with them on and off screen? Not really. We just we didn't get the giggles too much. We was a real fast shoot. We had a good time. I think we'd gotten real giggly in the elevator because you're all sitting there. And so, you know, to be frank, we were like doing fart jokes and stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> you trapped, we were trapped with six people in the elevator for like six hours. So we're like, somebody's <laughs> going to be sitting there. There's going to be a, a dull moment. Somebody's going to go, ah! and everybody just starts laughing like children. But, it, you know, it was, uh, it was as I recall, um, it was fun to do, but really fast. They really worked quick on that one. I would think that would be for most made for TV films, though. That's it, exactly. It was my first experience doing that sort of thing. Uh, I'd been working in London, and I came over, uh, and that's when I first said, so, oh, I got my first Disney sort of made for TV film, you know? And, um, but yeah, we moved quick. You know, you, you had to know what, you had to like, make a decision about your character. There wasn't a lot of time to like, and it's not like I'm playing Hamlet, but you know, I had to, I had to find the right notes in them and play them and, and see, you know, some of the physical comedy they let me when I, you know, was trying to start the car and I get sparked from doing that. We had to arrange that gag and, and try a couple of passes at to see what visually looked effective for, for a laugh. Um, you know, and so that took, I mean, that took a little time and they were very patient credit to DJ. He was very, let's try it again. Let's do it from this angle. Let's look at this, you know, so, cause it's got a button, the scene and it's got a button with a laugh. And so he tried a couple of passes and finally, I think he got something that looked okay. What is one of your favorite lines from the film? I know oh. mine is probably after, uh, hold on, spoiler alert for people. If you're, if uh, I'm going to, Reveal a spoiler for the end of the film, but I think we all know what it is. Um, but uh, once the doors open after you guys are saved by Abigail and, and Abby, uh, excuse me, by Abigail and Sally, yeah. Uh, yeah. you say, ooh, what a rush. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds about right. That was, yeah, the, the sort of, you know, spacey hippie dude thing was a lot of fun to play, you know. I don't remember a lot of the lines. I just remember there was, and they gave me like a little bit of a serious monologue, you know, and I was like, okay, yeah, all right. Or an intent, intent intended to be heartfelt monologue. So they kept trying to write that kind of stuff in. And you know, he's Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. He's like an older version of Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. And we were speaking off air about how you worked with Kirsten in Drop Dead Gorgeous. Mm-hmm. So have you worked with any of the other cast members or seen them since the film was made? Oh, I saw Ulster. Actually, I, I, I emailed him a while ago because he was on like a castle. You know, they, they haven't played villains, but he's such a nice guy. Even when he's trying to be villainous, he's not... Doesn't you know? I, I'm not. I don't think he'd kill you. We would joke about it because he knew me. For, I did a show in Britain called "Whose Line Is It Anyway," and so he knew me from that show. And so we, you know, I would talk to him about England, and you know, we'd talk about some of the people we knew from the UK who had worked when he was an actor here. Alstar, I really enjoyed hanging out with, and MZ Strickland, no longer with us, but was, I mean, her history. She's in, gosh, she was like in uh, the Fuller Brush Girl with with Lucille Ball. Um, you know, she, she was in the old Hollywood and she was so sweet and so full of really nice stories. I mean, a lot of times, um, a movie set can, you spend a lot of time waiting for the shots to be set up, right? And there's a famous story about Orson Welles where a reporter goes to a location in the small town. She, she's from the town they're shooting in and Welles is doing a, a movie and she watches him and he's walking around eating at the craft service table, you know, looking at the script, da, da, da. And they go, we're ready, Mr. Wells. And he gets up. And they go, action. And he goes, yes. Cut. Okay, print. We'll move to the next one. And the reporter walks over to him to him, and says, Mr. Wells, with all respect, I don't see why they pay you all this money to act. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. I do the acting for free. It's the waiting they pay me for. Nia Peoples was really fun to be with. She, you know, she's small and perky and stuff, but she's actually very serious when she gets to her work. She's very on it. And Kirsten was just rolled with it. You know, Kirsten was really easy going and just rolled with it. And that's, you know. We were talking a little bit earlier about A Bug's Life and your role as Tuck and Roll. And you were also in one of my favorite underrated Disney films, Treasure Planet, as the role of Hands. And so what was it like instead of seeing yourself on screen 
just hearing yourself and seeing a character portray what you're trying to convey. Well, in the case of Bugs Life, uh, John Lasseter worked with me very, very carefully. I, I, I met John Lasseter before he was associated with Disney when, when Pixar was still in uh, Northern California. Uh, he just called me up and said, I'd like to talk to you. And he was exactly as you imagine him, this generous, gregarious passionate and compassionate man with the loud Hawaiian shirts, you know, and he wanted to teach improv to the, he wanted improv to be taught to the writers, you know, to, to get them to uh, work on stories spontaneously. I just did the thing. I go, so which one's older? Which one do you think's older? And he goes, I think the one, you know, I said, we, did, we agreed that I think the, uh, the one with the unibrow was older by eight seconds. And so the relationship was that thing, like, you don't know what you're talking about, kid. What do you mean, kid? You know, there was that sort of thing. And um, so you had a, a fractious relationship of brother, you know, sibling rivalry. But, of course, when, when the crunch comes, they're there for you, you know. There's, the, there's, an, you know, there's another old quote. You know, Nobody beats up my brother except me, but he's mm -hmm. still my brother. Then we, we try to invent this gibberish. My favorite part is, is you know, I did, I did the voices of them for the, the ride in Disneyland. My wife's uh, surname is is Polish, is Samski. And so I actually interject her name in the ride. So many things like, he has kind of Samski, what's he doing here? That, so I, she's now lives in immortality as the voice of a bug. So that's your voice that they didn't tweak anything? Oh, no, no. It's like, ah, no, you're fired. You're fired. No, 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 you're fired. Yeah, there's all these great gags in it. I mean, when they're in like Bug Town, and there's there's a fly that's begging on the street with a little sign that says "Kids pulled off my wings." <laughs> that's that's it's his, so yeah. dark. <laughs> it's, it's exactly it's, but you know that's it, and that's where improv comes in handy. You you can you have a theme, and now you sit around and just play with that theme, and you know nothing's nothing's a bad idea. So you collect a cornucopia of ideas, and so then. You, you, you write the structure, and you've already got ideas and segments to, that reflect the structure that you're doing, and it makes it rich. You know, there, there's a richness to applying improvisation to a finished product. If you know, you know that one is improv and one is structure, and you, you set some structure, you know, you just you draw a line, you draw a circle in the sand, and you play as hard and fast and as fun as you can within the circle. It was weird. It was, you know, it came out. Everybody loved it. They really enjoyed it. And it seemed to be overshadowed by the later films, um, you know, especially the ones that are much and truly, in some ways, richer and subtler visually and emotionally, like Wall-E and, and Up, which are, you know, kind of, especially Up is a philosophical rumination. And it's very touching, very wonderful. Um, you always hope, you know, that, that somebody decides that they, they it's worth taking a look at again. I mean, ho Hollywood is is the place of sequels because sequels economically are, are a better are, are an easier idea. And and I know people don't think it's a good idea, but there are good sequels. There are good sequels, and there are horrid ones too. Just like there are good movies based on Disney rides, and there are ones that aren't, which we won't mention. <laughs> So I have some Halloween questions for you. We're going to first start with your favorite Halloween candy. I like candy corn. And I do like the cinnamon, uh, the cinnamon dipped apples. Yes. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Kansas City in the suburbs. And uh, in the town I lived in, Roland Park, there was this one old house, a mid-Victorian house, which had not been torn down. And the forest, about a half an acre of forest had grown around it in the middle of this like suburban area. And so we'd play in that forest, and there were two old women that lived in there. And every Halloween, they would dress up like witches when I was a kid, from about, from about five, because I, I would start going when I was five years old, to about ten. And they would like have the candied apples and the toffees and the taffies. And it was all handmade candy. What's your least favorite Halloween candy? Oh, well, we used to get this awful waxy black licorice that was wrapped in orange wax paper. And the only thing it was good for is you could stick it over your teeth so it looks like your teeth were missing. It was vile. And, uh, you know, it was, it's like, you know, when your candy bag gets down to the last of the stash, there are usually a few pieces. And you're going, am I hungry enough to eat this? And your favorite Halloween song? Oh, gosh. Um, 
nothing really scary. Actually, I've been trying to find it. It's it done in minor chords. It's from uh, Popeye, the 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 original series of them, and it's the it's the song of the sea hag. It's all done. The and it's a it's a siren song. It's supposed to lure. It's supposed to lure Popeye to this island where he is he meets Alice the goon. When he goes, I love Popeye, and it's this weird plaintive minor keys and as a child i'd listen to it because it would be on cartoons and it would just kind of like give me the chills and make me really sad uh, it, you know it had a lot of heart in it and, and longing and i kind of identified it even then and i've been trying to find it and um that that would get to me and i'd say maybe um Probably the uh, Carmina Burana they used in The Omen, you know. But I, I'm, I love horror movie music, like Luciano Foley and uh, uh, Phantasm. So most embarrassing Halloween costume? When I was eight years old, um, my, my last name is McShane, but I was adopted. And my mother, I don't know who my father was, but my mother was uh, a Métis from Canada, French-Canadian and Indian. Uh, Native American or, or, or uh, First Nations. Um, and so when I was a kid, I grew up in Kansas where I could find flint arrowheads in my backyard as a child. Um, I was fascinated with uh, Native American culture. And so I dressed up as an Indian using all of my mother's leg makeup to, to, to give me what I thought was the proper tone. And I wore a little breech cloth and during uh, the stroll through to get treats, my breech cloth came loose. And so I was covered in tanning lotion with little tidy whiteies on, um, clutching my breech cloth while the neighborhood was just like loving every humiliating second of it. Oh, no. <laughs> it was miserable. The next year, I went as Dracula. That was easy. Now, your favorite non-Disney Halloween film. Gosh. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. Yeah, it's either The Wicker Man for me and Halloween. So now I have three Disney questions I always ask my guests when they come on yes. the show. They're called the Fab Three, so we'll start with the Donald one, which is, as a child, what Disney film would you always like to watch over and over again? Son of Flubber. Um, I like the idea of it. And also, it's connected to a very shameful moment in my life. Uh, we went to see it, me and a buddy of mine who's gone now. Um, and he was a real troublemaker. And he'd always get me, because I was like the fat kid, so I'd like, oh, I'll do it to be popular. And we went to see it and was really excited to see it on the screen. We st he started throwing popcorn at the screen just because he's, you know, he's kind of a punk that way, you know. So he goes, come on. And so I started throwing popcorn, and the usher grabbed us, brought us to the back of the theater, and the woman, woman who ran the theater, she goes, I'm going to put you on the bad boy list. And she wrote, our, and I gave him like an idiot. I go, I gave him, oh, Mike McShane. And John Lyons was the other guy, and he goes like, you know, Toby McIntosh, just some stupid name. <laughs> she, goes, she doesn't check, you know, because he was smart that way. He goes, well, he doesn't know. Years later, like I was an adult, I went back to hang up with one of my parents. I was an actor then. I went to the theater, and and they and I said, "Oh, this guy." She goes, "Oh yeah, we." She she was like, "Yeah, she was like the the Gestapo," and they go, "Oh, they knew her." This this gal around the theater, and the, and they go, "You know what? We still got her bad boy list." I go, "You're kidding me." Can I see it? And my name was there. It was still there, scrolled in the books for all eternity as a bad boy, <laughs> and uh, so I would watch it. Anytime it could when it came on TV later on the Disney on the weekends. Um, so that movie and oh gosh, you're asking me to like to pick my favorite jewel in the crowns. Um, probably Mary Poppins because of Glynis Johns and the story, you know, the wonder of it and the heartfeltness. I, I, I love Disney. I love a lot of what Disney does. I'm from Kansas City. That's where I was raised. Mm, nice. And my mother, my mother took care of Walt Disney when she was a student nurse. Holy and, cow. Because uh, oh her nurse's training was in Orange, California. I'm from Kansas City. Uh, but she went when she got her training and, uh, and he gave her a little bracelet, a little Peter Pan bracelet, which I still have. You know, my mom still had a picture I drew in us five of Donald Duck. Um, 
so as you know, it's it, it it looms very large in my my mind. When I was in the army, I was stationed in California for the last year being in the army up in Northern California, and I took a, I got a like leave. I got leave for a week, and I did what you did. I went to Disneyland, and I sat in the parking lot and cried before I went in. When I got there, I pulled over and I just pulled it, I cried like a baby because here it is, you know. And our goofy question, what Disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Blue. You have to sing the song now. <laughs> oh, man. No, I just, my, one of my favorite lines in the song is Phil Harris's voice. You know, you got them, man. You know, he goes, you know, he goes, he's, he goes, man, take it easy. And he goes, fall apart in my backyard, which is like the greatest phrase for just <laughs> chilling. Fall apart in my back. I still I use forgot it. forgot about that. It's such a cool phrase. Always loved his voice work with Disney. I loved him in the Aristocats, too. Yes. Speaking I, of cats, I, mice uh, are always scared of cats. So let's go to our Mickey question. If I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? I don't know. Probably, uh, Please Feed the Birds. That's a rich, it's a rich song and, and, and heartfelt. And having lived and worked in London... For 20 years, when I'll walk by St. Paul's, and the minute you, there's these, because you know, it's kind of on one side of the, the city, the financial district, with the narrow streets, and there's this one street, like Leadenhall, I think it's called. You come out, and it's right there on the same angle that the stairs that she sits on. And every time I see it, it here, you know, in my, you know, tuppence a bag, tuppence, tuppence, you know, and you go, oh, because he painted, that was a romantic picture of London. And that's the vision of London I carry with me. And it, it's a touching, wonderful film, you know. And you don't have to know the backstory or the whole Travers kind of you Just enjoy the art for what it is. And it's, it's a fascinating uh, song and, and just so sweet. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for coming on the show. Uh, listeners, I'm sure they would love to follow you. What is your Twitter handle? Uh, my Twitter handle is this Mike McShane. Perfect, and you can follow Mike, and you always have funny tweets that I love, and I always favor them. So uh, definitely follow Mike. And <laughs> that's cool. You know what I say to that? What a rush, Tammy! It's been a real pleasure. <laughs> When the mystery gets solved, I inherit the works. Cha-ching!